and welcome to the show. I'm Kath Vincent and today we have a fabulous lineup of guests to energize and inspire you. It's time to wake up your wow with your host, international award-winning speaker, Kath Vincent. we have best-selling author and award-winning success coach, Catherine Newton. She's going to be telling us how to think and grow rich today. Also with us is inspirational speaker, John Shackleton, telling us from personal experience how to meet your fears head on. And actor Shane Cortese is going to be on my sofa talking about breaking the rules. In the Wild Records music slot, brought to us by Jesse Wilde, we'll hear music from singer-songwriter Dave Alley to round off a show to wake up your wow. So John, thanks for coming in. No worries, great to be here. Well, listen, you're known as a performance expert and motivational speaker. What, what job title do you put when you're going through customs? <laughs> um, I, I actually don't agree with the title motivational speaker. I don't think it's my job to motivate people. Um, a, a bit like it's not Steve Hansen's job to motivate the All Blacks, is it? Because <laughs> if he's got an All Blacks not motivated, he's gonna kick him out. So my job isn't to motivate, my job is to inspire. Um, so inspirational speaker, I think is a better term. Yeah. But um, what I'm really trying to do is to help people harness the power they have inside themselves. So where does inspiration come from? I think it comes, we can be inspired externally but we've got to do something about it. Just being inspired doesn't fix anything for anybody. We've got to take that inspiration and run with it. And how does a person find motivation to then take their inspiration and put it into action? I personally believe a lot of that has to do with having really strong goals. If you know where you're going, it's a hell of a lot easier to, to get your own motivation levels high. Um, I think a lot of people are scared of goals or perhaps reluctant to set them. Uh, but once they have those goals, once they have something to drive them, uh, then I think motivation is relatively easy. So you've had some pretty lofty goals yourself. Um, yes, a few. <laughs> some a bit scary. Yeah. I did uh, a couple of years ago, for example, I, I set a goal of swimming Cook Strait, which I think was, uh, looking back on it, was a pretty stupid goal. Wow. But, uh, so Cook Strait, just for the benefit of everyone, that's the little bit. So on the map, if you look at the map, it's the little bit between North Island and South Island. Not that little. <laughs> How 20, far is it? 23 kilometres. 23 kilometres yeah, to yeah. swim. Yeah, yeah. It, it's not particularly the distance. It is one of the most difficult swims in the world, but it's not the distance. It's the fact that it's completely unpredictable infested by sharks and ridiculously cold. And, and um, ocean swimming is about uh, not, not wearing a wetsuit. It's about actually swimming uh, as, good, as nature intended, but with a pair of hogs. <laughs> <laughs> I got an image there. <laughs> no, you don't want to go there. Don't go there. So you're swimming literally in your little pair of little pair Speedos of and goggles. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And with any support or how, how does yeah, it? Yeah, you have a boat. Well, it's one of the most dangerous pieces of water in the world. So there are in fact three boats. Yeah. Um, and the Westpac helicopter is informed as well. It's a scary right. place. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't make it. It's very much a lottery. It depends a lot on the weather and on the temperature of the water. Yeah. And with it being um, so close to Antarctic water, you often get very, very cold water there. So I lasted six hours, but didn't quite make it. So, wow. um, mm. And so what happened? You know, you get out to the water, you go, damn, I didn't make my goal. <laughs> what happens then? Um, it wasn't particularly major for me for the next six months, but then after that six months, with another couple of stresses that came into my life, I, I did suffer a little bit after that. Yeah. Um, I went through a period of depression. Yeah. Not, I don't think due solely to the failure to swim Cook Strait, because I, I don't see failure as a negative. I actually see it as a positive, quite genuinely. Um, I learned a lot by that year's experience. But the stress of that and the stress of three or four other things that were occurring at the same time, the death of my mother and, and other bits and pieces, actually seriously affected me and, um, and I, I suffered a bit with depression. So, yeah. But it's extremely common depression, not for Cook Strait swimmers, <laughs> <laughs> but common generally. And there's a huge number of people that do suffer and uh, when the black, do the black dog hits you, it really hits you. How did, how did you cope with it? What sort of strategies did you have? Um, I didn't even know I was suffering. My wife took me to the doctor and, and said, ask him those questions. And um, the doctor asked me the questions and uh, I had no idea. I just thought I was majorly stressed. Yeah. 
But in essence, he told me that what, what the body's doing, what the brain is doing, is it's forgotten how to make serotonin, which is the thing that makes you happy. Mm -hmm. And so you need to reboot that. So I just, uh, I changed my life plan. I changed what I was doing. I looked carefully at my goals. I took all the stress out of my life as much as I could uh, and re-looked at where I was going and what I was doing. And over a period of time, I was able to solve the problems and move forward. Mm -hmm. So many yeah. people would not take on a goal that seemed big for the, for the exact reason that they could fail. Yeah. What advice would you give them? I think failure is part of life. I think it's a really important thing to do. Uh, one of the most important things that I teach my children is that you have to run towards failure. If you have fears or you have things that are holding you back, the only way you feel good about yourself is if you do something about those things. Yeah. So um, uh, the idea of running towards failure or towards fear is a really important thing. The more you fail, the more you succeed. I mean, if you're a music, we've got some musicians going to be playing today. Those guys don't just wake up one morning, pick up a guitar and say, oh, I think I'll be a rock star. Yeah. You have to practice a lot. And when you first practice, you're useless. Uh, but what happens is the more you fail, the more you get it wrong, the more you learn, the better you get. Yeah. So anybody that's not going to approach life thinking they'll run away from failure, well, they're never going to go anywhere. They're not going to try anything. They're not going to make any attempts. Failure is really important, and, and uh, anybody that hasn't failed basically hasn't lived. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit like learning to walk. You know, when you're a toddler, if you, if you didn't give it a go and fall over a million times, you'd, you'd never right. walk. If your mum and dad said, that's it, you've had your chance, now get in the crib, you're not getting out, yeah. it, life wouldn't be much fun for you, would it? <laughs> you had one go and you didn't make yeah. it, sorry. <laughs> yeah, we don't have a walker here, <laughs> no, in the family. <laughs> yeah, this one's, this one's not a natural. <laughs> Love it. So what's the next challenge for you? Um, physically, uh, I'm actually doing a million meters this year, swimming a million meters this year, which is, yeah, which you is... You never give up, do you? No, I, <laughs> I really enjoy the level of fitness uh, that that sort of gives me. So that, that's a big challenge, trying to get over the physical side of that. Um, in my business life, actually, things have changed dramatically in business recently. I've, uh, I've taken on a new approach or added a new approach to my speaking, which, which is helping people... Um, design and create a pitch or a presentation, which I don't know if you know, but um, something like that, Wikipedia says 75% of us have a massive fear, serious fear of public speaking. Yeah. So um, I'm helping a lot of people do that at the moment, people to present or to pitch. The, the concept of speaking applies if you're actually selling an idea to somebody, whether it's an audience of one or a thousand, doesn't make any difference. You've still got to present your ideas in the right way and the right structure and the right format so that people buy into them. So yeah. that's, uh, that's proving to be extremely popular at the moment. And people have to sell no matter what they do for a job, don't they? Every se Listen, you're married, right? So am I. <laughs> Not to each other, guys. But, um, so you did a great sales job and so did I. Every communication is a sale. Actually, I think he did a great sales job. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, yeah, maybe that's true in your case. But in my case, I had to do the sales job, as you can see. <laughs> so every transaction, every communication with somebody, one person is selling an idea or a concept or a product or a service to the other person. Uh, and so I believe we all sell. Lots of people think they don't sell, but I think everybody does. Yeah, selling can be seen as a bit of a dirty word, can't it? It can, it really can. And yet, uh, I think we all do it all the time. And I think it's really important that we understand that there's a structure to it. There's a, a, a way that makes it easier. Yeah. Um, not only from our point of view about delivering the sale, but from the buyer's point of view as well. Yeah. So they don't feel stressed, they don't feel pushed, they don't feel as though they have to make a decision. Yeah, and even if you're just trying to get your kids to go to bed, you're selling it's them on It's a sales idea. job, <laughs> absolutely it is. I've noticed with my kids, talking about kids, I've noticed with my kids, if they want something, the conversation is very different than if they don't want something. If, if they want something, it usually starts with, Daddy, I love you. Because yeah. <laughs> they know they get my attention, they know I like them at that point so they can now sell something to me. Uh, I don't think they've ever been on a sales training course, but they understand the concept, and I think we all do. I yeah. think everybody does. Yeah. yeah. Well, John, we love you. Thanks so much for That's joining nice. us today. No worries. Great to be here. So welcome, Catherine. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure, and congratulations to you too for this awesome show. It's <laughs> exciting. <laughs> so listen, one of the things that you teach is that any of us can truly create the life that we want. Tell me a bit about that. Oh, look, it's very much what um, our lives should be shaped on. We should be taught this stuff at school, Kath. 
To me, it is absolutely fundamental. In 2006, I read The Secret, and for me, it changed everything. I, I had this real uh, epiphany and awakening almost that, yes, this is, this is true. However, what I also noticed was that a lot of people didn't quite understand the principles of it, right? There's the ask, the believe, and the receive, but they were missing the gap in what it actually took to manifest and create the life of their dreams. So the core concept of The Secret was just to explain that. Yeah, this, the core concept of The Secret was the fact that, you know, you really can have the life of your dreams. You can create absolutely anything if all you do is ask for it uh, and, and be open to receiving it and believe that it's possible, right? So then there was this massive big gap that happens out there in the community of people are like, they just don't understand that whole concept. To me, uh, I, I truly understood it and it got me really excited. And that's what's kind of got me started on this journey of getting out there and teaching this work. So now you've actually been involved in co-authoring the present day version of mm. the Napoleon Hill classic, Think and Grow Rich. Firstly, how on earth did you get involved in that international bestseller? Well, first I did the very thing that I teach my clients to do, and that is to set the intention. Right. So after I, I, uh, I started on this journey of becoming a Law of Attraction practitioner and then an entrepreneurial success coach, I set my intention, and what I wanted to do was I wanted to be able to you know, to give myself credibility, because that's, that's what I know happens and helps us to to really to build our businesses. But also Think and Grow Rich for me was very iconic. It was a book that I devoured um, through my 20s and 30s. And uh, I just could so relate to the message behind it. And of course the message behind it is dominant thought. And um, that, you know, things do become, you know, into our reality, um, what we focus on expands. Yeah, so yeah. basically thoughts become material things. That's it, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So quite literally, a person can literally think and grow rich. But what has to happen in the middle? Ah, well, <laughs> this is what got me so interested in, in, in the book, of course. And uh, there's, the, there's a, a number of principles that we must follow. And, and first and foremost is that we must uh, ascertain exactly what it is that we want to create. So we must have this goal in mind. And John, of course, spoke about goals too. I'm, I'm a big believer in the whole um, notion of goal setting. And, but I talk about it in the form of intention setting. So you must be very clear about what it is that you want to, uh, to do. Then you must be very clear about what you're going to do in, in order to receive it. So uh, for example, if you are a coach, you know, what programs or offerings or talks are you going to do in order to make that money? So we're not talking about the concept of just sitting back on the couch and, you know, yeah. ha, ha, <laughs> okay, if I just ask, yes. believe and receive, then it'll, just, it'll come to me, exactly. <laughs> Where's the money, right? <laughs> and then you must focus on it. And, and, and I think this is one of the things that, that helped to really shift and change for me around that, uh, the art of creating the life of your dreams was that we must give it focused attention in the morning and at night. So Napoleon Hill's iconic book was written, when was that actually written? 1937. Wow. Mm. So, I mean, those ideas in that book would have been really revolutionary and they still stand the test of time today. Well before their time, yeah. well before their time. And uh, he talks also about the importance of masterminding. And I think that's one of the key difference that, that I know uh, is, is, was absolutely paramount in helping my success. Uh, and, and something that I, I run mastermind groups as a result, because did you know that we are six times more likely to succeed when we are surrounded by like-minded individuals mm -hmm. and we're part of a mastermind group? Because actually people quite often think that they have to work alone, that they have to do everything themselves. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work like that. <laughs> so tell me how a mastermind group works. So, uh, well, the mastermind group for me, first of all, uh, if we take a step back and we think about, well, where did this idea come from? I, I come from a teaching background. So for me, it's very natural and very normal for me to stand up in front of a group of people. But my, my intention, my goal, my dream was to, was to build a tribe of people who were like-minded that were, were all seeking to be in the same direction. So I work with women entrepreneurs primarily and help them to, to build businesses that uh, are fundamental to their dreams and help them create the life that they love. So we get together with a group of 10 to 12 individuals uh, in, in the group and um, every, every week we brainstorm and we philosophize and we, we create uh, business ideas for them and just help them to, to, to live uh, the life of their dreams in a much higher way. 92% of people know that they want more, mm -hmm. Kath, but they don't know what they want more of. And it's not until you get into the energy and the vibration of, of a group of people 
that's when you know you can literally lift your vibration enough to start to magnetize and attract the things to you that you truly desire yeah people very quickly say well I'd like this but how can I that's or right. that's not possible yeah. so almost we talk ourselves out of it before that's we right. started that's right they so you so do and and then they try to do it by themselves yeah and that's when we get stuck um, and it's very hard to to lift our vibration when we're doing it by ourselves yeah mm -hmm. so when you talk about vibration what do you mean by that I've, I'm glad you asked that actually well to me and it's and it's a, a well-known fact of course is that we are vibrating beings we're made up of million and millions of neurons and these neurons are constantly doing their thing um, reacting or um, yeah it's, it's literally converting what it is that we're thinking or feeling and turning it into energy and so uh, if we are in the vibration of doing something that we love so think right now about something that you love to do, right? Oh, doing this. Oh, good. Love yeah, it. exactly, exactly. And that in itself lifts your vibration, right? Yeah. So when you're in the state of love, of joy, and of oh, gratitude for what you do, what you are doing is you are becoming an attractor. So you you are on the vibration of attracting. Yeah. And that is how I got to be part of this iconic book. I mean, a, a girl from New Zealand, you know, how does how does she get to be involved in the 75th anniversary of Thinking Girl? And actually, Shank? you're not just involved. Look at this. You're actually <laughs> on the front cover. It's <laughs> brilliant. I love it. And of course, something I something I prepared earlier. <laughs> uh, of course, some the the vision board. Uh, the vision board to me is something that is uh, fundamental because when I look at this, this is my business vision board right so this is me you know masterminding with my tribe uh, this is me connecting in with with high-profile people Oprah Winfrey and um, since putting this up um, this vision board together um, I've actually met Stedman Graham who is Oprah Winfrey's uh, partner and he he handed me my um, my award my coaching award oh, um, in Los Angeles I know thank you yeah um, uh, you know various people on here that are, mean something to me but this is what I would suggest that people do is that, is that put things on the board that they resonate with that, that gets them excited I mean nothing makes me feel happier than helping people to succeed by helping them to do what they love so I'm going to surround myself with those images yeah. and uh, and to do that is, is is another way to lift the vibra the vibration cool so mm. some very simple tips from Catherine mm. first yeah. one you know really simple probably the simplest one get a magazine cut out some images that speak to the life that you want thanks Catherine thank you so much fantastic thank you Shane, I am so excited that you're here. Oh, well, thank you very much for having me. I feel I'm in an, an electric vibrating seat <laughs> with John and Catherine. I can, I can actually feel the vibration yeah. from here. I kind I of operate in flight mode, so <laughs> I won't vibrate. Well, actually, I don't want to embarrass anyone, but at least one member of my extended family thinks you're really hot. Okay. You Did know you, who you are. Yeah, and now you come in and you say it's my mum. <laughs> It tends, <laughs> tends to be what people say. My mum um, thinks you're really hot things. Well, I, I'm not going to say it's my mum, but I will say that I won't mention names and I'm accepting roast dinners. <laughs> Does that give you a clue? <laughs> there you go. But listen, um, you are, you know, in our lounges all the time. You've been on so many, uh, you've been on Shortland Street, Outrageous Fortunes, uh, the almighty Johnsons like that. I mean, you're, you're on every show, it seems. <laughs> I wish. How, <laughs> how did it feel to go from, because you used to be a travel agent. Yeah. How did it feel to go from really quite a regular sort of job to being famous? Uh, look, I, I was a travel agent in Palmerston North. I, I, when I was at school, all I wanted to be was, was a travel agent. And, and um, I used to follow a, a local travel agent in Palmerston North around the streets. His name was Ian Flyger, a great friend of mine and a, and, a, and a mentor back in the day to me. And I would, uh, I would finish school, I would then walk around the PDC Plaza, or whatever it was there, and, and I would chase him down. And every Friday I would ask if there's a job going, Mr. Flyge, and he'd always say no. And I'd end up working for a year with the BNZ, but they didn't stop me on a Friday going asking for a job. One day he just relented and gave me a job. Awesome. That yeah. is, that's exactly like, and it, you know, you hear about people like Elvis who are knocking on the door every day. You know, that's the thing of persistence, I guess. I still knock on the door today. Yeah. But he gave me a job. I stayed with him for seven years. It was a wonderful seven years. But in that seven years, I traveled across to England. I took groups to England. I saw the shows and et cetera. And and I got involved in the local amateur dramatic society because I wanted to go out with a particular girl that was heavily involved with yeah. it. And I, and, um, and I fell in love with the, the, with the arts. I fell in love with the people in the arts, the, the different 
um, personalities of people and, and uh, after having been to England I decided I wanted to do that as a career. Now I could go to one or two places, I could go to London or I could go to New York and New York was not an option for me because of visa. And I got a job at the Theatre Royal Drury Lane which was an incredible theatre yeah. and at that time it would just started to house the original vision of Miss Saigon. And I got a job front of house giving people their brochures and programs and and escorting them to their seats and I slowly worked my way up the ranks to what they call a red coat and a red coat was a, uh, a person who <coughs> looked after people in the in the special hospitality rooms and they were a slightly high elevated version of a, of, of a blue coat usher and then I went on to be the fireman there and had to lock the place up at night and I was just a, and I just threw myself into that environment of the theatre world and from that I met people and, and I auditioned for a, a a job in, in a local version of Annie when they were paying 50 quid a week something like that to, to do it and if it went okay then they were going to do it at, again at Christmas time on a you know, equity minimum basis and I, uh, I got the gig so it cost me money to go and do it but I loved doing it and I was seen doing and doing Annie and I got I got that job and, and a man from the Chelmsford Repertory Society came to see the show. Chelmsford Repertory Society was a, one of the last two full repertory societies in England where you, you rehearse during the day and you work at night and then the following week you do the play that you've rehearsed all week and you start rehearsing on another one. And that first particular musical that they did was the Rocky Horror Show and I played a ghoul. And I had to wear a mask and I, was a, I had to do the assistant stage management work and whatever and, and after, this, after the first night um, I asked my friend Kevin, who was also a ghoul, I said, when we take our bow, should we lift up our masks? Because oh. no one knows who we are. And he says, we can't do that. It's just, it's, the show's been set, figurative, that we have to do this. I said, well, I'm going to lift my mask up. <laughs> <You know? laughs> what and a I rebel. Did. Yeah, well, I, yeah, it was. I, I broke some rules. I didn't break the law, but I broke some rules. Yeah. And uh, the next day I got called into the producer's office, and uh -oh. he, yeah, he basically had a, he tore a, a minor strip off me. He said, look, the show's been set. You can't do this. And I says, oh, look, I'm very sorry, but we're not even in the program, and I think I work hard, and it was just a mask off. He says, the show's been set. But actually, anyway, have a look at this. And it was a fax that had come through, and the casting director from Rocky Horror London, the West End version, was in that night seeing somebody else, but I took a shine to what she saw and was inviting me in to meet Richard O'Brien and Christopher Malcolm the next week wow. to audition for the West End version. How exciting. Which I did. There was probably loads of feedback from people's mums going, <laughs> who's <laughs> that cute dude that picked yeah, his mask? that boy. <laughs> it was a boy back then. Mm. Oh, how lovely. So what are you working on right now? Well, I finished two projects, uh, one project this year and another project last year, but both the same. Nothing Trivial and Almighty Johnson's, which are wonderful shows to be part of. But uh, they were both decided that um, they weren't going to be filmed anymore in the same week, which was a bit of a blow. Yeah. Um, but it opens up opens up plenty of doors. So we're now hunting in Australia, and at the moment, I think the 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 concept of television is changing so much that people are now making television for other channels or for for internet or there's a different way of viewing it. And, and what you've done, you've decided this is what you want to do. I'm going to make my own television program. I think that's what what it's about now. So I've, um, I've partnered with a, a very successful writer and producer and now we're developing a project that, um, that I want my name attached to, which is a completely different role from what I've ever played before. And now we're going about uh, developing that and scripting that and getting that off the ground. Yeah. And I don't think, you know, my, my dream, my hope, my, my vision is that we don't have to go down the network route anymore, um, that we can produce our own our own work, our own television programs, because we can access it at any time. There's so much more choice now, you know. The world has really changed, you know. Um, a single person can be a business and just set it up in five seconds with a business card and a URL. You know, you can make your own TV shows, you can watch what you want when you want. It's an exciting time to be in, it's an exciting time to be in business because it's, it, the, the world is a village. In terms of managing your workload and your motivation because sometimes you know you've got two shows on the go and you must be full on mm. and then other times you know less so how does that work you know this i've had this conversation once before i don't think there's ever a middle ground with the work that i do it's always the most incredible hires you know when your agent calls you up and they say that you're wanted for this job it's the most amazing feeling and that hap that can happen every day yeah. you know that my phone could go now it's so exciting You've turned uh, it off there, right? Uh, yes, it's <laughs> off. Um, or there's, and there's the, inc the, inc the incredible lows of, oh my, my, my God, nothing trivial is, f is finished. Is this the last, was that my part? Was yeah. that the job? 
you know, was that the last one? So there never seems to be a standard, a standard ground, which is which I like. I like living, yeah, on the extremes. Okay. So you've designed your life how you want it to be. Yep, yep. It's uh, it's not finished yet. <laughs> You're still young. No, we're still young. So. We're, yeah, we're still young. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming in, Shane. That's Lovely awesome. to be here. Thank you. So, Jesse, welcome back to the studio today. It's great to be back. Who's playing in the studio today? Today we have a fantastic artist named Dave Alley, um, one of my favourite singer-songwriters, incredible talent, and here he is. Thank you. isn't it? <laughs> it certainly is and we're very lucky to have Dave because he's just flown back from doing 20 odd shows in Germany and Austria. Wow well join us here's Dave right now. Thank you. So tell us about the the tour Dave. Uh, the tour was mostly with a trio uh, German violinist Tony Garling and English guitarist um, John Sanders. So um, real international mix. Pretty international stuff, a whole blend of music. Um, we played the song, I just played Funeral Demons. Um, everything from that kind of thing through to Celtic music uh, and Eastern sounding music. So quite a, yeah, definitely quite a blend. Yeah. And um, played a couple of solo shows as well uh, in Germany and uh, in Vienna as well. So, yeah. And you have a new album out as well? Yes, a new album, uh, Simple Ain't Easy. Simple ain't easy. Simple is <laughs> not easy. It's yeah, it's quite. It's difficult. like common sense is uh, not common practice quite often. You got it. Yeah, definitely. Um, the the album title came to us at uh, the breakfast table actually in Germany. I was speaking with the uh, with John Sanders about about music. Um, some of the songs on this album are quite quite simple. Three chords, four chords. You know, nothing, no rocket science. Uh, but to make that effective and um, and be happy with it is. Yeah, there's a bit of, bit of an art to that, mm. shall we say. It's along the lines of less is more, I guess. Exactly, yeah. Mm. yeah. I have to say, Dave, 
women would kill for your lovely ringlets. Oh, several have tried. <laughs> yeah, I've, had, I've had to run many times. I'm sitting here yeah. enviously going. <laughs> <laughs> I spent hours on it this morning. Mm. <laughs> looking good, looking good. Thanks, Thanks so much for, for joining us. Absolute pleasure, thank you so much. My thanks to all my special guests this week, to Catherine, to John, to Shane, to Jesse Wilde and to Dave Alley. And until next week, don't wait to wake up your owl. Wow.